Hello, everyone, and welcome to another webinar by the Functional Aging Institute. We're so excited that you're going to be joining us today. Uh, we are very excited to, to welcome back Robert Linkle, who's going to be sharing with us the benefits of progressive resistance strength training for the older adult. Now, if you haven't uh, seen any of Robert's stuff or followed Robert at all, somebody that you want to follow and uh, see what he does, he's got a great facility called Be Stronger Fitness. Uh, where he trains older adults and uses lots of innovative uh, methods of, of strength training uh, in order to accomplish that. So, uh, Robert, so glad you're here. Thank you for doing this for us. Thank you, Cody. Thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Now, a couple nuts and bolts things as we get started. If you guys have some questions that you want to send Robert's way, send those uh, in the chat box. I'll be monitoring those, and I'll try to feed those to, to Robert during the presentation or, or hold some till the end. Obviously, we cannot uh, answer all the questions, so there's some things that maybe you want to get in touch with Robert uh, directly about, and that would be great. I'm sure he would love to hear from you um, Absolutely. after the webinar. Uh, always great to hear from people and answer questions, just have that conversation. Also want to uh, tell you about our Functional Aging Summit because Robert's going to be a featured presenter there doing a pre-con and a session that he'll be telling you more about at the end. But if you've not made it to the Functional Aging Summit, hey, why not multitask? Look up the summit in your search bar right now while we're getting going on this uh, webinar, and you can see uh, a lot of the great speakers and topics that, that we're going to have, and that's going to be in June in Albuquerque to coincide with the launch of the National Senior Games. So really excited about that and being there. So if you've <coughs> followed us at all and you've gone through our functional aging specialist uh, certification process, heard some of the things that we talked about, you know, we teach – uh, training the older adult in a lot of different ways. So getting out of kind of some of these old stereotypical boxes that we've put on older adults and seeing the possibilities of all the things that they can do, but also addressing their specific needs. So looking at things like balance, mobility, and cognition, and their cardiorespiratory function, and their musculoskeletal function. So looking at things like strength and power and endurance. And so really excited to really explore that uh, musculoskeletal area in much more detail with Robert as he shares with us some of the great strategies that he's used really successfully uh, over the years with his older clients. So that's enough for me. Robert, why don't you take it away? Yes, sir. Thank you, Cody. I appreciate it. And, uh, welcome, everybody. I'm really looking forward to sharing this information with you. This is the, uh, the first time I've been able to give this specific talk, and it is kind of an introduction to what I'm going to be um, hosting with the uh, the precon at the summit coming up in June. So, uh, if you like this, if you want more information, I'll give you my contact info at the end. But also, uh, feel free to join us live at the event. It's going to be awesome. We have three hours. I'm bringing a ton of equipment with me, all the rigging, all the bands, all the handles, everything the way that we do it, the way that you'll see in a lot of these videos here. So, really, this whole mindset of uh, working with the older adults and how. Oops, of course, Cody asked me if I had volume on these and it's on the first one. Uh, we, we have a, a theory and a strategy, <clears throat> what we call our blueprint of how we work with our older adults. And strength training, obviously the name of our business is Be Stronger Training. Strength training is our biggest priority. I feel like any goal that we're gonna pursue with any of our clients, we are gonna get there quicker, more efficiently uh, with building a foundation of strength to come in first. But a lot of our clients are suffering with a physical limitation or our pre-surgery or even in some cases post-surgery are lacking uh, what I call bite, the muscular, the deep tissue, the, the deep connective uh, muscular strength recruitment when they're in deep flexions or in, in long extension positions to really get their musculature to activate well. And we see this a lot after surgeries as well uh, with the client, especially with the hip and the shoulder and the knee replacements where they're just lacking this, this stability strength. So we found kind of this happy medium working with progressive resistance band training that has helped us build that, that gap, bridge that gap in that, in that sense uh, to really get us to the point where our clients can get over the hump. Now, once we introduce the progressive resistance with them, we will, we will kind of take through this to get them to consistent load, meaning a, a 35 pound dumbbell is always 35 pounds where with a band it gets heavier and lighter. We'll merge those two together and then we'll progress them through strength progressions to, to get them to the point where they can do consistent load, but we pretty much always include some kind of progressive resistance. It's just such a good, you know, meaningful component to what we do and the people that we work with. 
Um, just a little history about me. I know some of you have joined us before, so you may have uh, heard this, but I'll, I'll go quick through it. Um, basically, I just like to show this so everybody can see in this industry from an entry level trainer being uncertified and getting a job because I looked muscular and I looked fit was, was offered a, a job as a trainer because they were desperate to get someone. I went in to interview for a front desk position and they said, we need a trainer. Here's your polo. And off I went. I was much stronger, much more fit than I am now. And I got the job, but I had no idea what I was doing. And I, I failed. I was not a good trainer. I uh, struggled continuing through the industry, trying to figure out what to do. I worked as a floor supervisor, cleaning equipment, doing orientations, to eventually getting hired as an independent contractor, an employee, a assistant, uh, fitness director, a fitness director, assistant general manager, and then eventually on to open our own space in a sublease facility and then budgeting and going through everything to open our own space. So I like to share this and show everybody that you know, this has been something um, that I've been building for 20 plus years, but I've been in pretty much every position of the fitness industry. You may be at one of these or need help on your next step. And I'm always happy to, to lend advice and help out a little bit as we go. This is the one video I do leave the volume up just so you can get a feel for how intense uh, the sport of hammer throwing is. So this was me back in 2007, right around there, 2007, 2008. And uh, I am sponsored here by Reebok. Uh, I'm pursuing uh, the the goal is to go to the Olympic Games. I'm pursuing a, a Pan Am Championship and an Olympic qualifying uh, mark of 213 feet three inches. My best throw was 212 feet seven inches. I was an All American or a, a NCAA qualifier, just short of being an All American in 2004. So I had this this quest to become you know the next great American hammer thrower and. Um, I was not physically gifted. I, I just, I had a hard work ethic. I was a technician. I'm really small, 6'3", you know, 230 as a hammer thrower. A lot of these guys are gigantic. You know, they're 6'6", 6 6'8", 6 6 300 pounds. So I knew I had to outwork these people as we went through. And the only way I could think of that is whatever everybody else was doing, I was going to do double that. And if they were throwing 20 throws a day, I'd take 40 or 50. If they were squatting twice a week, I'd squat four days a week. And so I trained myself to be able to, to work at a high level with retrospect now when I look back and knowing what I know now, if I would have done two thirds of the amount of work and done it a little bit smarter and more efficiently, I would have thrown a lot further. I'd probably still be throwing. I'd still be competitive in that sense. But I wouldn't change anything because everything that I went through um, led me to this point. It gave me a lot of opportunities to learn about the human body because mine started to break down. So quick little uh, review of, of how things went for me in 2008. It's a very long story about the, my whole experience being a really good back squatter and having my back blow apart on me. Uh, but 2008, I was in a weight room and sitting warming up with 225, nothing heavy uh, for me at that, at that time. And I felt my L5-S1 blow apart in my back. And uh, basically three days later, I had to have a surgery. So my, my back came apart. Doctor told me, you know, your throwing career is over. I, I still had hopes and really wanted to see if I could rehabilitate and get myself back. And uh, after about a year trying to do that, um, it was pretty, pretty obvious I wasn't going to be able to, to make a return to that sport. I had a uh, client of mine that was pursuing the seven summits, climbing the, the highest seven mountains on each continent. And uh, we had trained for two at this point. And he was doing well, but he wasn't in great shape. I didn't really know what to expect, what he was going through with, with this experience. So uh, I went to Mount Rainier and I climbed Mount Rainier in 2008, I used the experience after my back surgery in March to get myself ready, you know, to go do this climb in September. So I rehabbed my body through, I went and did this climb and I, I learned exactly what I, need, you know, I needed to do to, to help him become better. But in the process of doing that, I found a sport now that I was in love with and I wanted to become a mountaineer. And uh, I had set up things to go climb Mount Shasta and Whitney, and eventually I was going to go climb Denali, you know, Mount McKinley in Alaska. And I uh, started a program working with 15 of my clients who were going to go climb Shasta with me. And six weeks before our summit bid for that, uh, I started coughing and during one of our dinners and uh, social, and I had blood all over, blood speckles all over my hands. And so I went into the doctor, I had all these issues with my breathing over the last 10 years. And uh, Doc said, you know, hey, we need to take an x-ray. So they take the x-ray and I know how this works. It's happened, you know, 30 times. You leave three days later, you get the an email or you get a phone call. And before I could even leave the parking lot, he called me and he said, you, you got to come back. So I had a bronchoscopy and went through and found a, a tumor, a carcinoid tumor in my lung. 
So I had a major surgery. I'm gonna show you a picture of it here in a minute. It's a little gruesome, but I'll give you a little idea about what I went through. Uh, completely severed through my lat, my intercostals, removed two of my ribs, broke two more, I had to take my lung out in, in one piece. So I had a, a major surgery. And uh, in the process of rehabilitating through that, um, they noticed that my thyroid continued to grow and they, they eventually biopsied that and found another carcinoid tumor in my thyroid. And so that the year after that, I had my thyroid taken out. I had a good run about four years there before my hips really started breaking down on me. Uh, I had two arthroscopies. Um, one nice thing about working with the demographic I work with, you have a, a lot of opportunity to find good doctors and get good referrals. So I had the Sacramento Kings uh, surgeon who, who did the surgery for my hips, did a great job. And he goes, hey, I'm, I think I bought you a year, but you're going to need hip replacements. And this was, you know, at 35 years old. Uh, I also had blown my wrist apart, uh, tore a ligament, and I had a, a ganglion cyst there that needed to get repaired, and so that got fixed that year, and uh, in time for me to prepare for 2016, and we did it. My quality of life was so poor. Uh, we had a daughter, she was almost three at the time, and I couldn't get up and down off the floor with her. I was scared of falling down because I had such a hard time getting up and down, and this is, you know, a, a 35, 36-year-old man who you know, was sponsored and was pursuing the Olympics. And now I'm having issues getting up and down out of the car and, and issues getting out of bed. And my, my hips were just so painful. I was miserable and I couldn't enjoy my day to day. And then here with my clients, I couldn't come in and, and wobble around and hobble around. So I faked it. I pretended like I was fine. And uh, <clears throat> eventually got to a point where I said, I have to do this. So in April, 2016, I had my right hip replaced. It repaired really well. I rehabbed it really well. And, uh, you know, I said, okay, let's get the other one done. Let's, let's do this in one year. August came around 2016, did my left hip. And as a rotational athlete, when you turn in one direction so many times, I mean, hundreds of thousands of times, uh, you build musculature that presets your body in that direction. And so I was kind of pre uh, positioned to um, have my hips internally rotate and kind of shift and kind of move my pelvis moves a little bit when I stand and when I walk but when you're knocked out your pelvis sits neutral everything's kind of shut off so they put the the hip where it should have been but when I activated my musculature and sat up it actually dislocated my hip and uh, two days after my surgery it popped out they put it back in and it popped out again there it is sticking out there and this happened seven times, just over and over and over again. Eventually, I said, we're going to have to redo this whole thing. So I had another surgery 24 hours later, and uh, I have a matching set of really nice hips now that work really well. But I had uh, quite an experience there. I threw in a hernia repair in 2017, just to make sure I have the full gauntlet of uh, older adult experiences. Um, luckily for me, with my cancers, I... I had surgery, so I don't really call myself a cancer survivor all that often. I'm more of a, a surgery survivor. Uh, I was blessed to not have to go through treatments, but uh, having gone through that experience and uh, all the, the issues in my hips and my back and such, it gave me quite a experience to reflect on working with this older adult as I kind of am one, as I kind of am this, this uh, demographic. So here are some of the pictures my wife and I uh, my, my experience going through, I know it's a little gruesome, but I, I do like to share it with people, let you know it's real, it really did happen. And uh, it, was, it was quite an experience to come through. Um, this is after my first hip replacement, my first walk outside, and uh, my near three-year-old is, is walking in front of me, clapping, saying, come on, daddy, you can do this. You know, and I'm like, hey, I was just teaching you how to do this a year and a half ago. So it was quite humbling, but uh, a whole experience learning how to walk again. And uh, I like to say this, especially if I'm, I'm doing any kind of talk for um, new trainers coming into the industry or um, professionals that are trying to find their demographic. In some cases, your specialty will pick you. You just need to recognize it when it comes up. I'm not big on quoting myself, but I want you to, to kind of get that experience. My mindset was so focused and so set on working with athletes and becoming one myself that you know, if I didn't recognize these experiences that I was having as learning opportunities, I don't think I would have found this. And now I could not be happier. I absolutely love who I work with. I love these people. I love what I do. I love how rewarding it is. I had one lady this morning tell me that um, 26 years ago, she attempted to take her own life. And she's just now realizing um, that she's been in a 26 year depression, basically, and she's coming out of it now. And she feels like this was the kickstart. 
of that. And so to, to take an athlete that increased their vertical jump by three inches or added 20 pounds of their bench press, that's cool. But to me, to have somebody say that to me, that they felt like I had something to do with that, that I see them smile more. She's like a different person. And we've been, you know, we're eight weeks into training. I mean, two months, that's it. She's lost 30 something pounds. It stopped smoking, like all these things that I, you know, I gave her the speech about lung cancer because I had it, but I, I got mine from asbestos, not from smoking. And, and I, I shared a little bit with her there and just getting her in here every day and doing this. It's, it's so rewarding. But I, if I didn't have the opportunities to reflect, I don't know if this would be really something I would be that passionate about. So you need to take those experiences. And when client or when other trainers ask me, well, how do I, how do I get to that? Right. You don't have to injure yourself to have an experience to reflect, but work with people who have and see how much you can help them and, and the benefits that they reap from your experiences. That That is just, that's massive to a lot of our clients. And so it really drew me to the idea of this is going to be my demographic and specifically the last 10 years. Uh, these are the individuals I've been working with and the clientele that we've been building. So I was at a country club just two blocks away from here, really ritzy, fancy, beautiful place that, you know, the towels were literally sponsored by Mercedes. And, uh, you know, they gave water to people as they walked through the door. And I left and moved into a garage at a CrossFit gym. And um, we subleased space until we could afford the, the one that you see here. We were there for 18 months, we saved up quite a bit of money, my wife and I, and then we had a, a really nice loan uh, that we were able to take through my dad being in the military. And uh, we were able to open our place. It's 2,000 square feet, 2,500 total with offices and restrooms and such. But basically what you see behind me is a 2,000 square foot rectangle that we train in every day. And uh, my schedule is 4 a.m. to 11 a.m. Sounds a little crazy. I get up at 2. I'm here by 2.45. I program till about 4. And our first client comes in at 4.15. So we have a pretty busy morning, uh, all semi-private, Monday through Friday. We do 45-minute and 75-minute sessions, kind of depending on the client and their abilities. But basically, everybody's here for about an hour and 15 once we get them up there. Um, pretty much all older adult. Our average client 63. And they all have physical limitations, every single one of them. I don't have anyone that's just fine. Now, in some of the videos, you'll see people and you're like, that girl looks like she's 20. I've got three clients that are in their 20s, but I train their grandparents. And that's why they are here is because grandma and grandpa said, hey, this place is great and you've got a bad back and you should come and see me. So we have a lot of families. Uh, and some of them, we have three generations of people that, that we work with and all different experiences, all different ability levels. And you'll see, you know, quite a, a few um, different body types and ability levels all in here training together and just, you know, kicking butt and having a great time. So it is extremely rewarding. I'll share a little bit more about the gym uh, at the end. This is us when we started in the top left. That's how we received the gym. Uh, the cleaners came through and gutted it out. And within 72 hours, you know, coming all the way down the aisle that cleaned it out, we brought in our flooring, rolled it out, and then all the way back up to the top, we were able to open our gym um, three days later. And uh, that's our, our expertise. There's my wife and I and her best Team Wolf impression, bringing in our new squat racks from Rogue and getting a new door put in and all that. So when people ask, why do you train older adults? I, I feel like I've built a reputation now where even my daughter uh, knows it. There, she gets this uh, old gentleman in a wheelchair in one of her Christmas gifts. And he also happens to have a nephew in the, in the kit who's a skateboarder who has a beard. So she pulls his head off and puts it on the wheelchair and says, look, daddy, that's you. And we, you know, now built this relationship where she understands and sees that I work with older pops and that I have some of those limitations and she's very proud of it. I'm very proud of it. And we have a very good time. Uh, our family and I, as you, if you follow us on Facebook, you will see that that is a big part of my life. My people here, my, my work family, and then my family at home. <clears throat> so all of these experiencing us to this, this is our blueprint. And uh, if you're screenshotting or any of that, just email me. I'll send this to you. I'm not shy about it at all. The whole idea to this is how can we create a system to implement our resistance training with our older adults that fits their need? Because a lot of times when we pulled other trainers, they just kind of said, well, the two reasons I don't like to work with older adults, <clears throat> excuse me, is that I don't really know what to do with them and I'm afraid I'm going to hurt them. So over the, the years of kind of thinking about our philosophy, I slowly started putting this down on paper and you see at the top, it says the fourth generation. Um, I've had years and multiple different uh, takes at creating this and next year it will probably say the fifth generation and I'll have different things that I've learned about and I've started to implement and we, we continually change this to try to make it that much better. But to this moment, to this day, 
I feel like this is the best blueprint I can provide my clients. And we teach these exercises typically in this order and then in the progressions. We have a, a hinging component. There's five components that we do every day. We have a hinging component. Typically we do two hinges. And these hinges, if you can see my cursor moving here, these are our more auxiliary or the simple ones. And these ones are pretty much all on the floor. So we call it a horizontal bridge or a horizontal hinge. And then we have mid range where we go to a standing position and we will deload this and kind of work them up. I'll give you examples of all these. And then we have complex or compound and these are the more advanced ones. And the goal isn't to get them into the third column, it's to teach them all three columns. And then once they can do and they're capable of doing all that, now as the, the creator, as the cook of the workout every day, I can cook up whatever I want because I've taught them all of these, right? Now it's just open range, we can do whatever. So how do I teach? What is my progression? What exercises do I do? Where do I slide them to? That was the whole idea of this. So we do a hinge, typically two. We do a row, typically two. We do something where their feet are split. We do something where they have a, a loaded carry. Of, and I have one additional, somebody remind me, I'll show you the video on here when we get there because I didn't have time to upload it. But I have one additional loaded carry with resistant bands, which is kind of hard to do. But I have a very specific client who has a uh, limitation that I think a lot of people have that this works great for. So, so remind me of that. So we have the loaded carry and then pull, raise, and press. Notice how it goes pulls and then raises and then press. We have such a hard time with this demographic in my experience with frozen shoulders and limitations at the shoulder of getting them to press overhead that my intention is to get them to pull from overhead first. And when they get really good at the mobility of pulling overhead and they develop the strength of pulling overhead to get them to be able to raise you know, lateral raises, front raises, posterior raises, all kinds of different flies, supinated, pronated, an empty cup, full cup, et cetera. All the different raises we can do to 45 degrees, to 90, to 135, to 180, to eventually they've now increased their range of motion and their mobility, and they've been able to build strength to get their arm to that position, then we could try to press if they're capable at that time. So really I see the pull as a big priority there. And those five components funnel down into our one training modality, which I know I'm preaching to the choir here. Fall prevention is such a huge deal and it's such a big fear. Instead of having one component that's like, this is balance training, I can implement balance training into all five of those components. I can do you know, a, 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 a mixture, a complex of anything different exercises in different positions to help them work on their ability to stay on their feet and to not fall and to anticipate a fall. Or if they do fall, they have the bone density and the awareness to fall gracefully and survive that fall. So five components, one training modality, all progressive, all on one page. The whole idea is to make this as simple, as simplistic, as easily applicable for all trainers, but especially if you are uh, owner or manager of others, gym owner meaning and then managing others you have a really good tool to teach them how to do it and my intention is not for you to take mine and say implement it it's for you to take this idea this philosophy put your information down on that grid and then you teach it because <clears throat> if you look <clears throat> excuse me if you look through this you're probably looking at some of the stuff saying i don't know what that is and i don't have equipment for that because i built it for this training space but we can assist you in building one your way for your people in your space with your philosophy. The whole idea is, is you need to have a blueprint. You need to have a way to do this. And in many cases, it's just putting it down on paper. You need some flow like this, some kind of, we call this the ABC component. Where am I going to start and where am I going to slide my people to with each exercise that they do? So these are the things we teach. Our trainers now have this ability to do this and, and they know exactly what, you know, what is to come. <clears throat> All right, so we got 35 minutes. We're doing good. The reason for progressive resistance. I just filmed this yesterday, and I wanted to do this. It's going to play in slow-mo in a second. This is at our house, so I didn't get it done here. I needed my wife to record me. And just so you know, so this plays in, like, decent tempo. I am going as fast as I can, but recording it in slow motion, so it's not perfect, so don't judge me. I was really trying to get it like fast. I was banging them out. But then when it's in recorded in slow motion, it's just a slow progression inch. So the whole idea is to be able to showcase to you, okay, as we're moving here, the displacement of the hips to see what I call the triangle of hip displacement. And you'll see this a lot in uh, all of our deadlifting components and our hinging components. We really want to um, teach our clients displacement. And with hip and back injuries, this is one of the most susceptible injury points, what I call exposure, which is that point right there, okay? 
I'm at my deepest point of flexion. I'm most exposed to hip injury or back injury with consistent load or improper technique, okay? So the beautiful part about the progressive resistance is I've got a 40 pound band in my hand and as I come down, that band gets lighter and let's say that's 10 pounds at the bottom and as I come up, I'm at about 40 pounds, 60 pounds, 80 pounds when the band is doubled over, it's double the load. So I'm able to get the progressive resistance, the maximal load benefit when I'm at my strongest there. So now my hip replacements, my bag, my loading com components, they can get the benefit of, when we, we talk about osteoporosis and the bone density, it needs that pressure pushing down or resisting against the body. I get that benefit. But when I'm most susceptible to the injury, the load goes less. So this philosophy for, philosophy for me came about doing this motion. Getting into hinges was really uncomfortable for me. And <clears throat> I think it was from throwing all the years that I did, I was so hip flexor dominant that learning to unlock my pelvis and stick my butt out was really uncomfortable for me. So I've had to build since 2016, I basically had to leave my quads alone, my hip flexors alone. I still train them a bit, like we still do step ups, I still do all that stuff. But I've had to build the back half of my body, what we call the Timmerman approach. And if you, <clears throat> you join us on our webinar series, I just did a presentation on that. And we'll be releasing that webinar in a couple of weeks, just as an independent um, purchase that you can get. So I'll tell you about that later. But the whole idea is to learn this hinging component, this position where I can build strength when I'm at my weakest and reap the benefit as I come up. And there's a, a beautiful part of this, but also makes it a little challenging sometimes is the client can control the load themselves. So if they feel like it's too hard, they just move forward a little bit. If they feel like it's not hard enough, they back up. And then once we say, if the band has now doubled in length, which is its maximal load by, by instruction, if you have a 40 pound band that has, it's this long, and then you double it in its range, it's now 80 pounds, right? And it returns to 40 pounds of resistance. If I'm able to take it beyond the 80 pound mark or double length, it's time to band up. I can make markers on the floor, like behind us here, if you look at the ground, I have little lines every two inches or so. In the back room where we have anchors at, we have one every foot or so. So we have indicators where the client can set up to do whatever exercise it is, you know, an anchor pull or a, a pull down or a face pull or whatever we're doing. And they're like, oh, I'm on a blue band at a, at a number four. I could back up to a six and now I have resistance. And as they start to, I call it good suffering. If they start to suffer, then they can just move forward a little bit. And we get the progressive resistant benefits and components and strength, but they're also able to, you know, work in an increased range of motion that maybe they wouldn't typically be able to do. So under consistent load, and what I mean by that is if I'm holding a 45 pound bar, it's always 45 pounds. At the bottom of my hinge at the top, it's a consistent load. With this, it's progressive, okay? In some cases with some limitations, the range of motion could be limited with a consistent load because I don't want to go any deeper because it hurts me, right? With, with a deeper hinge like this, for me, 45 pounds at the bottom, in the beginning, it bothered my hips. I wasn't strong enough to handle it. So my hinges would be really short, where I can now get the benefit of both components, as we've talked about, as it comes up and increases. And then you allow for free articulation, is, is a term that I use for it, depending on the joint. You're going to see a lot of attachments where I'll hook up different handles. I, I love angle 90s. Uh, I have a, all kinds of different anchor points that we use that I really enjoy and I'm, I'm comfortable rigging these things up for our clients and then they can freely move it wherever they want to if they want to do a supinated row if they want to do a neutral grip row if they have an injury to their hand or their, or their fingers they need to adjust or move things around with certain barbells you're stuck in a supinated grip at 90 degrees you're stuck at a pronated grip you know neutral positions can become difficult some of the angles of the pulley handles are stuck so this allows for freedom of, of the grip which can be these minimal little changes that you make that make a huge difference to the, difference to the client. So I really like that and, and different angles of pull are of huge benefit as well. So I'll give you an example. I have a client that every time we do what we call a retraction shrug, instead of shrugging up, we teach our clients to retract their shoulder blades back. And so we're working, you know, high rhomboid, lower trap, posterior delt. We're trying to get them to posture up basically as a cue we use. Well, every time we do that with her, she gets this cramping sensation between, because she's between her levator scapulae and her upper trap, she just dominates there. And so it starts to cramp up on her. So if we do that from a low angle, that angle of pull is countering. It's, if it's low and in front, the direct component that's bracing the load is 
high and up top. Okay, so we know that is the opposite and equal reaction, right? It's low and in front, the bracing point's gonna be high behind her. So if we can change that angle of pull, move the band up higher, and maybe not necessarily parallel, but a little bit lower, I can change that angle of pull and start to shift things down a little bit lower. And so you're like, oh, of course, you would do that on a cable pulley. In many cases, you can't adjust the cable pulleys, right? Plus, whatever load is on the pulley, it's always the same load for the most part. So this opportunity is kind of like a halfway, a medium in between. And then once we get the client kind of over the hump and they're feeling pretty good, we will add consistent load to the progressive resistance, right? So looping a 30 pound band around a 20 pound dumbbell. Now I'm starting with 20 pounds and as I pull it, it's 50, 20, 50, 20. And now I'm getting the same benefits and actions, but I start with a consistent load. And we can work with clients for years in some cases to get them really strong to the point where they can just do consistent loads. But in a lot of cases, like myself, consistent loads I have a hard time with. And in some exercises, I'm fine. Other ones, I'm really exposed and it doesn't feel great. So I'm going to go through here the next 30 minutes. So I'll, I'll do like 25 so we have some time. And I'm fine going over if people are okay hanging for a little bit. I'm happy to answer questions. But as we kind of go through here, I'm going to give you just a little bit, like four or five exercises of each of these. Because I want you to see how they work and how they go in. Feel free to implement them. And if you have uh, tips or advice needed, just give me a holler. Okay. So starting with the hinge. Uh, this is one of our, our first ones that we'll implement with a client where as they increase through their range of motion on just a traditional glute bridge, we are able to work on their shoulder placement by getting their shoulder blades to tuck underneath them. Notice the palm placement, okay, palms up. And then as she braces up against the band, that band will basically, these are all little um, XL bands from Perform Better. Each one of these bands is about 10 pounds. So she's got 30 pounds, 10 pounds, 30 pounds, 10 pounds with the aggressive load as she comes up. She, uh, Ellen, comes from um, a knee injury and a back injury background for us. So this was a great starting point for us to kind of introduce a strength component to her. From there, we take our hinges that are based on the floor and we start increasing range of motion by elevating the feet. So same practice. Notice we have palms down on this one. Two clients with uh, posterior shoulder issues that we're working on getting them to pull their elbows down and anchor. And notice Jerry on the far side there, his arms are coming up. That's okay. He's, I call this the battle between upper and lower, the good and evil, the upper and lower. The lower half is bracing hard, trying to drive up through that band. And the upper half is pulling down, trying not to let the upper half come up. So obviously it's all one system working together, but when we look at the posterior aspect of the body, from the calves, the hamstrings, the glutes, and the bridge, so now the lats, the rhomboids, the long head of the tricep, the triceps, the, uh, the, the traps, everything on the back side of the body, we're now bridging with the entire back half of the body on. And so we're really you know, focusing and utilizing everything while doing what most people think is just a glute exercise, right? So this is a great uh, combo that you can put together, a little complex, but boy, does it give them a high peak strength resistance and then an ability to come down when they're a little bit more exposed, have a little less load, and then reposition, redrive up into that high bridge position. Then we're ready to just flip that around now. So instead of the body being flat and then the feet being elevated, we're now gonna elevate the shoulders. And all three of these progressively are giving us a higher range of motion, a deeper break at the hip, but the same practice as the hip comes down, okay, it gets a little less and I'm able to break up, you know, push up high into this bridge position. Jerry, this is him pre-hip replacement. If you see him now, he's doubled his band and he gets that you, you notice he's like two or three inches short and okay, he's not getting a full lockout. He gets that lockout now. But my focus with him before surgery was I need to get him as strong as I can. Even if, I mean, we know the hip is damaged and it hurts as long as he can tolerate it. I need his butt as strong as I can get it. His abductors as strong as I can get it. His hip flexors as mobile as I can get them. And then the deepest bite possible. Okay. The 90 degrees, if not a little bit lower, again, this is pre-surgery. Okay. I need him to be able to get out of like a low booth, okay, a below parallel engagement of strength. Because I know after that surgery, that joint's gonna be, musculature-wise, it's gonna be very loose. They stretch it all out so they can replace it, right? So now the bite's just not there. But if I have a higher level of strength development there, he can rehabilitate back from that much more efficiently. And one of the nicest things I ever, I've ever received, uh, Jerry started this, I think we're on our fifth year together, now in year six. Um, the first year, he, he gave me a Christmas card that said, um, the things that I couldn't do before <clears throat> that I can now do. 
and it was like walk the dog without the fear of falling down. He had this whole list. And what was really cool with this one was um, he goes, I rehabbed in, in twice the amount of time that I thought it was going to take me. And he goes, I have a new level of, of trust for you now. I believed in you and I, and I thought that what you were doing was great until we went through this process. And he goes, I'm 100% now. Like, and that meant a lot to me from, from a guy that's gone through other trainers and just didn't have great experiences to now have earned that faith in him you know, in, in, in me uh, from him was really a great compliment. So um, these experiences, those are the priceless ones that we talk about. When we take them off the floor now and we're ready to put them into a vertical hinging position, so we went from column one now into column two, a lot of times the client's not capable or ready to do this just yet, so we can deload them, okay? We hook a band above, this is a 40 pound band at double, so right there she has 40 pounds of resistance, there she has 20, and basically she is able to hinge into a position with lighter body load on her than her own body weight would be, right? Let's say for easy math, she's 120 pounds, and this is 40 pounds at the bottom. She's got about 80 pounds of pressure on her hips, and then she's back to her regular body weight at the top. To get more glute activation, so it's not just glute max, we put the band on around the top of their knees, and she's, she's actually isometrically holding apart, okay, pulling apart while she does that to get all three abductors or all three glutes to fire. So this has been a great one for us with our clients that are just super locked up at the hip. They're really cautious or scared of their back, and so if we can take a lot of that pressure away with a 100-pound band, right, and then drop that to an 80-pound and a 60-pound and work their way down between building the range of motion and the strength from the floor, the marriage of the two really starts to produce great results for them standing. And now a lot of the pressure that's based on their tight back and hip flexor is now shifting to their strong butt, right, and that pressure is kind of coming off their back. So we see that quite a bit. Once we're ready to deload them vertically, then we can hinge them with a self anchor. So John has this anchor um, around one foot up to his hand and down to the other. And then as he hinges and comes up, he gets a little retraction and notice the band we have, the progressive resistant bands we have around his elbows. John's a massive sloucher, okay? It's big time, four or five inches of internal rotation. They usually measure that in degrees. <laughs> and I go straight to inches because inches, it was huge. When I first met him, I thought he was cold because his neck was gone. He was so anterior dominant and just rounded in. So we put him in positions in every single exercise where I needed him to pull back because I only see him twice a week, right? So we have options like this to add constant pressure, consistent loads, but he also had a major back injury. He also has a little shoulder injury. So posterior chain issues that kind of come up, we can work the benefit of the progressive resistance and build him up to a point where he's you know, pretty strong and pretty capable. And then you can tell I recorded this at Christmas time. We have our lights up in the gym. This is what we call a rack pull. So we now have a consistent load. So as Jerry comes down, he can't go any deeper than the racks, the bar sticking out, because two inches lower than that is what I call his exposed point. He's going to get to a point where he's probably going to hurt himself if he does anything wrong. So we go two inches above, maybe four, depending on the client. And then to get his upper body to be active and to fire, we actually put little resistant bands on the bar that pull the bar forward. So now he pulls that bar back hard to keep it into position, to lock his lats in. And then as he performs the movement, he contacts the rack, he gets his shrug, contacts the rack, he gets his shrug. So this is a great complex of what we call the retraction shrug or the retraction row, just those shoulder blades locking in. But he can't go too deep to hurt himself unless he tries. We can all bend over and round our backs but he's drilled this motion pretty well and he's got it down pretty good. You also see that knee popping out his left knee, what we're looking at on the right, that's the hip he had replaced. So he would have that side. It would wobble out all the time because it hurt, you know, for him to do straight. So that's a little quick little snapshot at the hinges. I've got, I don't know, 40 more of those to show you with all the little changes, little things in between there. And again, that's stuff we're going to cover at the pre-con. All right, to the rows, a couple of my favorite ones here. This is a supinated grip face pull. Um, if you're a Tony Gentlecore fan, if you don't know who that is, you should check him out. I think he's the inventor of the face pull, if we're going to claim that to someone. Typically, the face pull is pronated and you're pulling right up to your chin. A lot of our clients have these shoulder issues, internal rotation of the shoulder and the elbows coming up and really bothers them. So I kind of created something a little bit different. We go to a supinated row and we retract the shoulders down, but we're able to get this posterior fire, the shoulder blades down and into the back pocket. The rotation of the shoulder out takes some of the pressure off the bicep, and then any impingement they're having in the shoulder, we're still able to get kind of a high row, the benefit of the face pull, but not necessarily triggering some of the issues. 
I hear a lot of trainers say, well, you want to take a client with their injury and work around it. Well, the reason that the client's probably coming to you is that issue. So why are you working around it? You're now going to have all these abilities of the body and you already have one that's not up to par because it's injured. So now if you train around that, you just increase this ability of everything else and we're still lacking down here, right? So I want to make little tweaks, little changes, little positions from if it hurts when we're pronated, let's try it neutral. It's still a row. It's still the same muscle groups firing. It's probably the area that's weak that I need to train, but how can I address it without aggravating it, hurting it to build the strength needed to eventually get them to the point where they can do it? Or at least we can continue to do what we're doing here just with more resistance, right? So I'm all about finding little tweaks, little things. And if you ever come in and watch, we do the mentorships here. You can come and observe or just spend a day with me. When we offer those things, you're going to hear me nitpicking all these little tiny positions, foot placement, hand placement, where all these little things go. It's because one little tweak, one little change will take them from this face to, oh, that's so much better. And it's the, almost the exact same motion, right? So these are things that we want to um, have these aha moments with our clients, but really it brings great credibility to us because we're helping that. This is a half kneeling pull start. Notice the rotation of the band. Okay, see so he's getting that full pronation, supination. I like to go with that action because that's what the bicep does naturally. From the radial insertion, it likes to supinate naturally as it rows. He's half kneeling. I'd like his back toe tucked underneath him if he could. Uh, that would be a little bit ideal. But notice how aggressive he is on the pull in. The band is pretty tight for him. So he has to get a little momentum, a little heave. And then he's eccentrically letting it out. This is a two to one tempo for us. And we work that tempo on purpose. I want him to not be able to row 50 pounds of pressure, but to basically heave 50 pounds of pressure back and then eccentrically let that load out. We know that eccentric styles of training will get our clients much stronger, but are we gonna do negative reps with a 75 year old with a hip replacement and an AC joint that's separated? I can't do that, right? So how can I kind of find a happy medium? And in you know, one of the interviews with Arnold, he says, uh, Somebody gave him a hard time because he would swing the weights up when he was doing curls. And he goes, yeah, but I'm doing five second negatives when I do that. So if you're cheating a little bit to make the movement harder, there's more benefit on that end. As long as the cheat isn't hurting anybody or, or we're sacrificing technique, I like that. So all this is is a little inertial pull. Basically, I'm using a little momentum. That's why we call it a pull start. If you've ever pulled start an old lawnmower, you gotta put some oomph into it. It's not a single arm row. It's not a gentle motion, right? So we're getting that heave in there, but the benefit of the eccentric out is really what we're addressing. Okay, here's another one for us. These are just two handled rows. Notice all the different handles, right? I got spud handles, neutral handles, angle 90s, pronated alpha strongs. Like It doesn't matter what you use, but they rotate from station to station. So everybody gets a different grip, a different component that they can row on, as long as they're comfortable doing that. We'll do these in the seated position, but notice they have no back support, okay? So I want them to have loads that are challenging. They're able to maybe, you know, have to heave a little bit, and these are timed intervals that they're going on this. And I want them to, to start with a strict row. Notice their shoulders are down. They're retracting their shoulder blades first. The whole idea is to get those shoulder blades to fire, to get the anchor set before their arms do any more work. And if we're able to, to, to comfortably do that, and then they start to fatigue after 25, 30 seconds, well, if they start to heave it a little bit to get it back there, again, I'm okay with that because the further they lean back, even an inch or two, the band is getting longer, they're working harder. So to me, it's like, if you're gonna cheat, you're actually making it quite a bit harder for yourself than if you were to just stay put, right? So these are just little examples, little benefits here. So here's a traditional face pull. This is a true complex here. Um, this is a traditional hinge up to a traditional face pull from a low angle, but we merge the two together. So a complex of our hinge to our high pull. These are the two Franks. Um, Frank on the right is a little more mobile and a little stronger at the shoulder than the Frank on the left. So notice the difference in time here for these two Franks on how, how much slower, let me jump up here, how much slower Frank and blue, the one on the left, brings the band down. So he's really working this eccentric component because we're lacking some strength in the shoulder. I have him on like a four to one tempo where Frank on the right, Red Hat Frank, he's doing a two to one, okay? So we have different components, different tempos. All that goes on the programming. See my whiteboards back there? Okay, I've got nine, eight, nine more whiteboards over here and there's another eight or nine on the other side. That's where we write up everything. That's what I do at 2.30 in the morning is I'm writing up all that stuff for our clients. <clears throat> each little component for each person, each little adjustment, all personalized as we go through. 
And then if something does come up as we're training and we're going through it, if I have a little critique I need to make, I can go over to the board and write it up there. And that way I have a reminder and a note for myself. And then when we get done, I just take a picture of the entire whiteboard. So it's the actual board of what we did that day, right? And that way there's no transfer issues. I wrote it in the book wrong or anything like that. Uh, no, a part of our programming is not to answer your phone in the background <laughs> there. I told Alice, I said, I got this great video of Donna doing a hinge and row and you're in the back. She goes, well, at least I'm on one knee working on my balance. Yeah, good point. Uh, this is another complex of seated hinge. Again, I'm not a big fan of doing seated exercises unless we're working on something else. We call these row your boats. So we're in a position basically where if she were on a rowing machine, she would get that forward hinge. She would get the lean back and the row component. But what I'm not a huge fan of the rowing machine with a lot of our clients, hip impingement, back issues, the flexion is too deep, it's too far, right? Their, their feet are on the same plane with their hips. So the flexion of the knee and the hip, everything just comes in too tight, it's too close. So I can kind of get the, the benefit of the rowing machine, of the rowing component of rowing your boat, but on a seated, higher angle, open hip, lower foot, open knee position, I, I reap the benefits of each one of those pieces and I kind of marry them together. Also notice her hands as she's going here, the rotation palm down to palm up. Again, we're embracing that rotation that naturally occurs at the bicep, the wrist staying straight, the rhomboid squeezing together and her chest lifts up, right? These are rowing components that benefit and have a direct effect back to her posture. That is the biggest focus for us. All this stuff has to go back to what they're doing, okay, on a daily basis. All right, step ups. You can do this body weight, you know, step ups to start, but to start with some progressive resistance, you can use any kind of band, any tension, loop it under a foot, they can hook it through their elbows, hold it on their forearms, hold it on their hands. If you really want to make it tough, have them hold that in a little triangle up over their head or eventually straight arms, really challenging stuff when we get there. Okay, these are single leg step ups. This is called a kickstand. We call a kickstand, see his back leg. John does have balance issues. So we leave that kickstand, see him shaking around there. We leave that kickstand. Another component to this is kind of a, an additional bonus. The band acts as a barometer, a little space in between where his knee is supposed to be. So as he steps up, if that knee valgously collapses or vargously bows, he'll feel the band rubbing on it. So it gives us a good, a good you know, a, a window in which he knows where the knee is supposed to stay at. And then you can progress this up as much as you want. We will get to a point where I'll have his hands in closer. And then as he steps up to add a balance or a fall prevention component to it, he'll lift his right knee up, like knee to chest, balance and hold it there for a second and then return it. And then once they master that aspect, we'll start alternating step ups and eventually add load and take the band away. All right, split squats. This is one we get a lot. How do you work with clients that the hip and the back issues and the knees that hurt them? How do you get them to a point where we can eventually do split squats or lunges? This is one of the harder things we do. And not all of our clients get here. But if we do get the opportunity to do this with them and they're comfortable doing it, we deload them first. So Jerry has a 60 pound band up and over. It's already pretty tight at this point. We call this position hands in your pockets. So he's got his hands down tight. And then as we roll this, he's sitting on his back leg and that 60 pounds turns into about 80, maybe 100 there at the bottom. For a 180 pound man, he's doing now split squats with 80 pounds of pressure there and about 120, 80 pounds, 120. And so he's able to work that range of motion, train the range of motion, but not with his whole full body load yet. We'll eventually go to that red band and eventually go to a yellow band and eventually no band where he'll just have his hands next to the rack and eventually build that strength up where he's capable of doing that. So progressions and components there. One other one, we do have clients that they, they have a really hard time doing both of those step ups or uh, lunges. And we still have a split component that's just called walking, right? That is a contralateral movement. The feet are having to split, but most older folks, when they're walking, their feet are so small and so tight because they're so afraid of falling that if they take a big step, they're going to fall over. But what is really small and tiny at the bottom and kind of wider as you go up a top and tops are not very balanced, right? So a component for us to, to work our clients that aren't just ready for this, we'll just give them some progressive resistance. We'll hook them to a harness or a belt and we'll allow them to walk forward and learn how to displace their weight. Notice as I'm videoing her, I'm walking with her, right? Because my hand is right there against her back normally when I'm not holding the camera. Uh, Susan's done this a hundred times. So I'm right there holding her, right? And making sure that if she goes back, you know, we've got that band anchored all the way back to the post. She's really having to learn to manipulate her body weight outside the center of mass. 
and then to eccentrically deload it going backwards. So now we have practice anticipation moving forward and then practice decelerating moving backwards. 65 to 70% of falls occur in the backwards direction. So we are now teaching her what it's like to kind of get yanked backwards and anticipate that. And she's not gonna fall because I'm there to stop her, but she can learn how to do that under some resistance, right? So there's a lot of stuff all built into one. We can do simulated drags too. So the other one is kind of a pull. This one's more of a dragging component. As Cindy goes back here, I'd like her shoulders tucked in a little bit more, but she's getting a lot of pressure. You see how fast that accelerates her forward? sitting down heavy and then she's decelerating, changing direction and not letting it yank her forward as she comes off, okay? Into the loaded carry, I'm gonna bring this one up. Okay, so this is, oops, of course, let me hold, I'm sorry. This one is rolling. So Eva has um, a back injury that is bad enough to where she is not capable of carrying loads yet. So what we do, the camera's rolling right now, she's just isometrically holding, okay? And I think she stopped there. As it goes, she's able to get the pressure, get the tension, and she just holds it. And that's an isometric component for each side. We'll do both sides. We'll do a front and a back. And then another one that we have, here's Frank. I'll run this for you here. So he has bands around each foot. And now he has the vertical pressure pulling down on him as he walks by. See the bands hooked around his feet? Now he's getting, with each step, it gets a little lighter, heavier, lighter, heavier on each leg. He has a pressure point with each step, lighter, heavier, until he locks the band out. Lighter, heavier. So each step he takes, it's a little less pressure, a little more. Now, it looks a little goofy. We call those forest gumps because you feel like you're wobbling and walking goofy with your legs straight. And you are. But what this is doing is it's teaching him, who has a pretty severe back injury, what some pressure down. He only had, you know, two seven-pound bands. So it wasn't a ton of pressure for him. But it was some pressure. So now he can get progressive resistance with each step, harder, easier, harder, easier, in a carrying component for us. It's a baby step. Some people will look at that and be like, is it even worth it? Why not just give him lighter weights? I still need the benefit of all the progressive load. When he's at a stronger position straight up, the band is at its tightest, right? So it can work for just transitions of walking. His back injury is a point where just getting up and down out of the seated position can throw out. So I need to be really delicate with him but have each exercise have a benefit, okay? Pull components for us. I love these overhead pulls. We'll start at like a 45 degree angle here. Notice the grip is a little bit different. Notice how tired Jerry is in the back. <laughs> he's, he's exhausted. Uh, but different grips, sometimes we don't always get to have full handles that are nice and comfortable. It's still comfortable, it's just different components. She's gotta pull more with her ring finger and her middle finger, or her pinky finger, which most people don't know, the ring finger is where the majority of your strength of your grip comes from until the thumb closes over, right? So we wanna train those components separately sometimes. Some of the progressive resistant raises that we can do. Okay, up to 90 degrees, little isometric hold there of two or three seconds, and then a really two, you know, two or three second eccentric negative coming down. Shoulder blades are tucked in. Uh, Leslie has from T2 to L5 fused. She's locked in here. So a lot of this, she's always stuck up in her neck because she's trying to get any kind of movement from there. You know, she had a major car, in, uh, uh, car accident when she was younger, and they had to fuse her up. So we've been working on different components with her there. One of my favorites, the landmine, okay? A little hinge in and reach. Look at her range of motion at the top. She's vertical or really close to vertical there, right? But that bar is 35 pounds at the bottom, plus she's got an 80 pound band on there. So she's probably got some pressure. So let's say 45 there, and she's got about 85, 95, 105 pounds at the top. But she's in a really strong, capable position of holding that, but she couldn't take 105 pounds from here and press it overhead and bring it back down. But if she locked her arms out and you handed her 105, she could hold it, right? That's that pressure I'm talking about that benefits the joints, the ligaments, the bones. We need all that built in there. All right, here's a good one. This is called a pivot point. So a pivot point, this is Steve Jensen. This guy's 55, if you don't believe me. <laughs> I'll show you his ID. This guy's a beast. He's a monster. And I wish I could say like, oh, I got him. And, you know, I turned him into this. He has been like this. I've been training for four years now. We've made him stronger, but he has a major back injury. That's really what we've addressed a lot. You know, he's got uh, 270 pounds on here or something like that, 280 pounds, working on a pivot with the progressive resistance. So this is his version of overhead pressing because with his back, he just can't do it. So we'll hook up the pivot point and give him a position to basically get his head under the bar and more or less get to a near vertical press, what we call a neater press. Bob Nieder was a shot putter back in the days. Uh, it was able to get up to almost vertical, but it simulated a put for his throw. 
So he would train on this angle, right? Not great for everybody, but with our limited range of motion and the ability I was able to get him going overhead, this has been a huge benefit for us, right? So different components, different resistant angles, change the angle of pull, see what you can work on with people, okay? All that falls into our fall prevention. Uh, as we go across, I can apply single leg components, unilateral components, contralateral components. We do things as simple as closing one eye, we call pirate style jar. And then we have all kinds of different stuff we'll do with inline foot stances and separations and different throw, throws of implements. You saw some of the med ball throws going on in the background of these lacrosse ball drills that we do. Simple stuff like a $2 lacrosse ball can be a huge component in learning spatial awareness for a client. So a lot of our fall stuff just goes into all of these. We don't really have one category. Um, if you want more, and I want to get to Q&A, so I'm going to burn through this pretty quick. But if you want more, uh, we have our webinar series is going. It's year long. We cover all these. You know, we're coming up here to the end of May. We just did the Timmerman approach. But if you sign up, you get all the recordings and all the PDFs from everything else. I know quite a few of you are already on doing this with us and hopefully you could, you know, speak to it. Um, I spend a ton of time with you. I share everything that I know, you know, and you join us though. We do have what I call hands-on. It's usually me doing it, but it's taking you through and kind of troubleshooting all that. And we have a discount for all of you today. If you punch in strength at your uh, checkout, you get 20% off. And then um, Dr. Christian Thompson, you should all know that name very well. He and I are doing a live event here in October here in Sacramento. It's going to be two days of awesome content between his mobility matters and my training the older adult. We've got a great lineup of stuff for you to do. And again, that same promo code um, strength gets you a 20% off. So if you are interested, feel free to sign up for that. And you can find all of that information at trainingtheolderadult.com. And I strongly encourage and hope that many of you, if you're coming to the summit, to please come and join our pre-con because it's going to be an awesome event. I've got all kinds of great stuff to show you. I'm bringing a ton of equipment, so it should be really cool. I will go over the three hours if you're comfortable staying with me from 3 to 6 p.m. I'll stay there as long as you want and share everything that I can. So thank you all very, very much. I'm happy to stay and do some questions, and I really appreciate your time joining us today. All right. Well, thank you so much, Robert. Uh, obviously, great stuff there, and Love the videos. The videos obviously really help to see that uh, what you're talking about, see the real clients doing it instead of just, you know, somebody demoing it. So that's mm -hmm. always very valuable. Um, would it, is it okay to send out your blueprints by email to everybody that's on this webinar? Absolutely. You, I can either send it to you in a PDF and you guys could share out, or if you want to just email me, that's me right there, Robert Linkle. I'll send you the PDF. I can't share the videos, but you guys get a still shot of them doing that action. So you still get to see what's happening. It just, obviously you won't be able to download the videos. Yeah, there. that, that sounds great. Yeah. If you get that PDF to us, we have got everybody's uh, email that's on the yeah. webinar right now. So we can get that out to them pretty easily. Yeah, <clears throat> Had a few questions that came in, didn't want to interrupt your flow, but let's just hit on a couple things really quickly. Sure. Go back to when you were doing the supinated face pull. We mm -hmm. um, were talking about some shoulder issues that, require them to do it in the supinated. Could you kind of elaborate on that a little bit? Sure. Most of the time we see it's impingement issues with an upright row or with a face pull component. It's the internal rotation of the shoulder. So we'll see anywhere from calcium deposits to AC joints to uh, acromioclavicular issues of anything of, of swelling components. A lot of times the bicep tendon will click over and back into the, into the groove there, the interventricular groove. So we'll feel that action and I can put my hand on there. And as the rowing, I feel that musculature and things shifting or crunching around. So there's kind of a general rule of thumb, like if it doesn't hurt while you're doing it, in most cases it can benefit. It can, it can kind of break things up and help move. But if it does hurt, you're definitely doing damage or that something else is coming up. General rule of thumb, that's not always the case. But in my opinion, I don't really want that much crunching and moving mobility in there if I can make a change to help prevent some of those issues but still get the same benefit. So I will go to a neutral component or a supinated component and just work a different angle of pull to try to get some of that musculature or impingements or whatever we're working on to, to line up a little bit more efficiently. And most of the time, if you're getting something that's popping back and around or jumping around, it's because of an imbalance. And if we can work on balancing that musculature out, ideally it should groove straight. In rare cases, we see so much of a calcium deposit that it forces a, a tendon away or a muscle out of the way. Very, very rare. So most yeah. of the time it's, it's people using things in, incorrectly. Yeah, so it's when I got to that gentleman that was doing the angled pushes, um, yeah. and they said it was a beast. Mm -hmm. What did you call those presses again? It's a pivot. I call it a pivot point press. I know there's a lot of, there's, there's a guy, there's a gentleman that 
sells an apparatus like that. I don't, yeah. I don't know it. I don't know anything about the company. I just see some of his videos here and there, but I call it a pivot point. Basically it's something that we can shift and adjust and they can pivot the point of contact to where they want it to be just by moving their body. Yeah. And we can do like a bench press on that. We can do a, a neater press, incline standing bench press to a strict press overhead. We did rows on it today. We spun around. That's what I have rigged up right behind us there. You know, we have the angle 90 grips on there. They split their feet and they're able to row in and let it out slow. Mm. You can do it just pendulum weight. You can do it with progressive resistance attached to it. So I really like it. We just started this maybe a month ago and we've seen really good, you know, good benefits to our clients that have limited ranges of motion in some of these movements. Yeah. And was that just suspended by a strap, two straps? Yeah. These are Olympic ring straps. So okay. Olympic, Olympic rings, ring, yeah. 350 pounds. So I've got 700 pounds of support up there and the most we've put on there is 300. So I, I have no, no doubts that those will handle, but those work. Um, I know your, you know, your TRX straps, alpha straps, like whatever, whatever suspension devices you have on there. I just took the rings off, used the strap. But I, I think I'm robbing a, a, a gentleman of his service of his product. I do see that the benefit of the one he has, it's got a quick change where you can adjust heights and know exactly right, yeah. this one you're, you know, but if you have time to rig, go for it. Yeah, this, uh, and that's a pretty simple solution just to use the straps. Yeah, for sure. And so last one, we, we do have several other questions I'm not going to be able to get to, but, but here's one that, that, that I like because I like to address this is, you know, when, when other older adults come into your facility, mm -hmm. they kind of see, oh my gosh, there's weights there and there's people doing band stuff and, you know, people doing loaded movements. Um, do they have a kind of an automatic fear factor? Kind of how do you, how do you walk them through that? Yeah, we, um, we, we typically, I mean, 100% of our business comes from referrals. Uh, we have very, very little traffic here. We have very few people that just happen to stop by. So almost everybody that comes in has kind of heard about the experience, but they don't really know what to expect when they walk in. They're expecting to see machines and chairs and small yeah. weights and, and balls. And so I just tell them right away, I'm like, what do, you, what do you do through your day? What did you retire from? And I had one lady that was a retiring farmer. And she's like, I'm supposed to sit down. And I'm going to hurt myself. And I'm like, you've been doing one of the most physical jobs on earth. Right, exactly. <laughs> If we're going to have this debate, like seriously, that's what you want to do? And I said, I would do you an injustice. I'd be doing you a disservice to have you sit down. And so I say, I'm like, just don't, don't panic. Don't worry about this. And I'll go around the room. I'll be like, Jerry, eight years, Susan, eight years, Linda, 15 years. And then I've got, you know, Jan over here, four months. And you see what she's working with. And I'm like, these people have been here for a long time. And the other ones that have it, I'm not going to hurt you. It would hurt my business to hurt you. It would hurt my feelings for you to hurt you. Right, so exactly, yeah. Don't, don't let this intimidate you. But when you look at, you know, college sports, professional sports, this is what they're doing because it works the best, right? Mm -hmm. So why would I not find a way to implement that with a demographic who really needs to perform better? Maybe this is not on the field. You know, it's application to life, what we call the ADL pluses, you know, yeah. our ability to live and, and feel better. So it's a it's a learning process but it's a great way to teach them and disarm them and have them Absolutely. go okay okay yeah. that sounds good and then empower them through the process right they're gonna feel so empowered as they're able to do more and more which and is if they awesome. see other people too they're like oh that's what i you know i'm striving for i want to work up to what linda's doing and, and we'll bring people in that have been with me for a decade and a half and a brand new person on her first day and they go boy i got a long ways to go and i'm like don't panic we'll, we'll get there yeah. and we know the steps this is going to take some time and they they have a, a group to work with now well, that's great. Well, Robert, thank you. I thank everybody on the webinar for being here. Look, you guys know you got to be at the summit now, right? You got to come here a little bit more, Robert. Get hands on with, in that workshop. Uh, he, he's a great presenter. He's going to teach you a lot. Obviously, he's very passionate about working with this population. Uh, so we, we really um, sync up in, in that regards for sure. So love to have you out at the summit. Look for those, um, that PDF to come across in email, but be patient. Right, give okay. us a few days to get that out to everybody. Um, and wonderful resource. And then obviously follow up with, with Robert directly. Got, got his email right there. Check out his live workshops, other events that he's doing. Uh, you'll definitely benefit from it. So Robert, thank you once again. Look forward to seeing you soon. <clears throat> thank you, everybody. We appreciate you. Have a good All one. All right, guys. Take care and God bless. All right. Thank you.